Hello, yes, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about ERGA. Please just interrupt me if you have any questions, because um, my talk is actually does not involve, doesn't focus on a sampling method. Um, it does some other type of serial approximation, so it's uh, slightly different than many of the previous talks we've ha had over the last couple of weeks. Um, so to start off, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, my PhD advisors, uh, David Dunson and Galen Reeves. Um, so I'll be talking about ERGA, um, Integrated Rotated Gaussian Approximation, a method for zero approximations. Um, and to kind of to start off with, I'll focus on um, I'll focus on I'll focus on Bayesian variable selection as a, because that's a concrete example that it's nice to to kind of explain the method, but also to motivate the method. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about approximation accuracy, both empirical and theoretical of ERGA of the zero approximation, and we'll end up with um, kind of generalizing ERGA. So then we've only looked at this example. Uh, Bayesian variable selection, but actually ERGA is kind of, can kind of see it as a more general posterior approximation method, um, more general for high-dimensional posterior. So that's what we'll end up with to kind of be like, uh, to more fit with the title also then at that point. So let's start with Bayesian, the example of Bayesian variable selection. So here the um, setup we're looking at, we're looking at um, just a standard linear model. Um, so the long linear model has and observations, these observations are Y. We have a design matrix X that has N rows, P columns. We have a <clears throat> P, P unknown parameters, beta, so these are the main quantities of interest. And we assume that the errors, we have additive Gaussian errors and that they are like IID. Um, so, the, so it's like a multivariate Gaussian distribution with the identity covariance matrix. Um, so this is the, the, basic, the, the model that, said, that gives you the likelihood. Um, and we're going to do Bayesian inference, so we need to specify a prior. Um, and then, so we're pu kind of putting a constraint here for now on the prior. We're going to say, okay, um, the prior is separable in the sense that, um, like, the, 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 the prior entries, the entries of beta are, like, conditionally, in, a priori conditionally independent. Um, so, they've, 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 so the prior factorizes nicely. Um, and we'll be able to, um, this will, we will be able to exploit this. Um, and ERGA exploits this kind of independent structure there. I'm sorry? So usually people say X is design matrix and your data is what is random is Y. But sometimes people also say, well, Y and X is both your data. I see, but how is theta related? Theta. Oh, theta. So that will become... I think it's on the next slide becomes pretty clear, but basically theta is, is a hyperparameter, so it's it doesn't relate to x. It, it, it's really just theta is just specifies the prior on beta, effectively. And sometimes the theta might be unknown, so then you also have to learn theta as a hyperparameter you have to learn. But actually, um, this presentation won't really touch upon that, um, and we'll just focus on let's say you know you have a theta, you have a certain prior. Okay, what's now the posterior that that, that that prior yields. So the example we're going to look at, so if you have already this, this specific linear regression example, but then more specifically we'll be looking at Bayesian variable selection. So Bayesian variable selection specifies a specific prior on beta. So it specifies a specific beta given theta. So Bayesian variable selection, as the name implies, tries to do uh, variable selection in this linear model in a Bayesian fashion. Um, so it tries to find which parameters, which elements of this beta are actually non-zero. So to do that, it kind of says a priori in the prior, it's going to say, okay, with a certain prior probability, the, 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 the beta is actually going to be zero. So that's like this spike at zero. And then with another probability, um, it's going to be a, a, what they call a slap sometimes. It's going to be the continuous part of, 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 of then the it's going to be it's going to be non-zero. So then, if it's non-zero, we're going to say it as a continuous distribution, and we'll we'll just say okay, that's like a, a Gaussian distribution. Um, so then we can write this more like we can write down then kind of the like a way to write down that distribution is to say okay, well, let's say lambda is the probability that beta is not that beta is not zero. Okay, then with one minus lambda probability, it's equal to zero. So here we have like a delta a de delta distribution, um, and then. Uh, and then, and just when it's non-zero, we just have this Gaussian centered at zero in our case. That that's uh, most common, and then some uh, variance psi. So to come back to your to your question, Daniel. Um, so then theta here is like your 
prior inclusion prior prior inclusion probability and your variance psi. So that's that's then your theta. So this is a spike and slap prior. The spike is, the thing is at zero. The slap is the continuous part. This is also sometimes known as um, the Bernoulli Gaussian prior because basically you can see this. We first do a Bernoulli draw whether something is zero or not, and then afterwards, if it's non-zero, then it's a Gaussian distribution. So it's a Bernoulli Gaussian prior. Um, that's another name for this prior. So this is so this is a basic variable selection. It's a problem that's been studied before. Um, it's it's like we like last week we had um, we had a talk on the L zero minimization and it it's, it's like it's like related to that but then more like like the for instance the the, the, the map the the maximum the mode of the posterior for instance will be the L zero minimization solution. Um, so there's, there's some interest in this problem. It's like okay it's a, it's a kind of a standard vanilla way to do variable selection in the Bayesian fashion, um, and it's something that people might be interested in in the posterior is, is um, the posterior inclusion probability. So I say lambda is prime in posterior inclusion probability, but once you see the data, the data is going to tell you this prime is going to be, is, is probably going to be non-zero, and this one is probably going to be zero. And then that, um, that thing can be captured in like posterior probabilities. You can say, okay, what's the probability that one, that is specific, that, that any specific parameter is, is not zero. It's like included, it's selected, given the data. So this is actually a question about like a marginal posterior. So to answer that question, all you need is the marginal posterior. And as an, and more generally, marginal posteriors are, um, can be sufficient to an answer questions about posterior. For instance, if you want to, have a, want to know the posterior mean, it's also sufficient just to know the marginal posteriors. So here is kind of a goal to make our life a bit easier, to constrain our problem. We're going to say, well, let's say we're only going to focus on marginal posteriors. And since the ordering doesn't really matter, we just um, focus on beta 1 without loss of generality. So we're going to try and find a marginal posterior for beta 1. Um, and then, so that's uh, just you have to take the full posterior, you integrate out all the other betas, um, and then, so the full posterior is given by the Bayes rule, by this equation. Um, so now, okay, now we've set it up like this. It's the beta 1 is kind of our parameter of interest, so now we can kind of say, well, hey, these beta 2 to p, they're there in the model, but they're not really of interest now at this point. So we can kind of say, well, let's call them nuisance parameters. Um, that's just for now, we're going to look then you know what I'm referring to if you call, say, nuisance parameters, parameters later on in the talk. Um, then the number of possible subsets, so it's different subsets that you could select, um, grows exponentially in, in P. So you could, so that's if you talk about all the betas. So um, if you want to compute this normalizing constant, you have to kind of sum over all the poss poss possible prior configurations. And the prior is like this um, IID Bernoulli choice of is this, is, this, is this beta included or not? So therefore you have like two to the p different, you have an exponential number of these different subsets in your prior already. So the posterior has to sum over that and therefore your posterior is a mixture, um, it's a mixture of two to the p Gaussians. And this kind of shows like where, why this is a, a challenging posterior to compute. Um, so it's kind of this discrete, this combinatorial nature in your prior causes your posterior also to to be very rather intractable, and therefore, um, if you want to apply this Bayesian variable selection model to any kind of data that has more than a couple, like 20 or 30 uh, predictors, you'll have to do some approximations because it's going to take you, it's it's going to take too long to actually compute this posterior exactly. So therefore, then posterior approximation comes in. So this motivation is why we're doing posterior approximations in this scenario, um, and therefore. A, a variety of posterior approximations have been um, developed for this. Um, so more generally, the approximations here, like we can group these exception approximations in two groups. So one thing and we've heard, um, so one, one big group is sampling-based methods. So that um, mostly actually includes, uh, he, for this problem, people have done a lot with Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and then popular examples are Gibbs sampling, um, and so there are some, some older methods. So Catholic search variable selection is basically just, just straightforward GIP sampling um, on the basic variable selection problem from 1993. Um, but since then, people have tried to improve on this. And, and so for instance, you have this, something called Bayesian adaptive sampling that makes some more smart, uh, smart use of the structure in the model to, to speed up the sampling. So this, it's attractive, the sampling, in the sense that if you run the sampler an infinite amount of times, you get you have like theoretical guarantees, you get this exact solution, but it's, um, 
But the, the main challenge with these methods, especially in this problem with uh, Bayesian variable selection, is that it's hard to assess whether you've actually converged and whether you've properly explored the posterior. So e e say you, even though your MCMC diagnostics might tell you you've properly converged and you, and you seem to explore the space well, you might, for instance, actually be stuck in like a local mode because, again, this discrete nature might, might give you like, discrete, like separated patches of your posterior for which you actually need to run your posterior, uh, like your sample a really long time to properly explore the full space. And it can be hard to assess whether you actually have whether that's going on or whether that's not going on. So therefore, as an alternative, there exist more deterministic methods that are like, like, more like iterative in nature. They just converge to a, to approximation, and then they take that um, as the posterior approximation. So there are um, variational Bayes methods uh, developed. Um, expectation propagation is quite successful here. Um, and that's kind of a, and, and also kind of a, well-known examples, uh, expectation EMVS. Um, but the, the main challenge with these methods then is, okay, you, you don't have such a theoretical guarantee that if you run into infinity, you get arbitrary close. So it's like, so you get an approximation, you get often some kind of Gaussian approximation somewhere, and then the question is, okay, okay well, how good is this approximation that you did to this, to this complicated posterior? Um, so kind of what Erga then, what Erga then kind of tries to contribute to this, to this kind of state of the artist and says, okay, well, let's do something that's more deterministic, but let's try to do, be more explicit about how we do approximation, and then maybe you can maybe trust, no, no, trust is maybe the wrong word, but more see where the approximation is happening and therefore maybe be better understand the quality of our approximations. And actually turns out by doing this, um, being a bit more interpretable, we can actually um, do a little bit of theoretical analysis even that that and similar guarantees are for these methods are like um, don't really exist as far as I'm aware of um, so let's a very brief overview of Erga before we dive a bit more into details is um, so we want to find the marginal in this Bayesian variable selection example so we're going to achieve that by approximately integrating out these nuisance parameters and will be based on a data rotation um, and then like I mentioned, because you do a bit more of transparent approximation, we'll be able to do a little bit of theoretical analysis as well. Um, so what is like the main steps? What is IRGA? It's first we rotate the data, so to isolate the parameter um, of interest. So in this case, we're going to rotate the model such that we isolate beta 1. Then we have that leaves then the new parameters, the other betas, um, uh, remain there, and then we can actually kind of group them as an auxiliary variable that, ca that summarizes the influence of these parameters onto our parameter of interest, beta 1. Then we're going to estimate the mean and covariance of our auxiliary variable, like the posterior mean and covariance in this, in this posterior in, this, in a certain sense. Um, and, we can, and then we can use any kind of method that we like to find that, um, to find a mean, the posterior mean and covariance of that part. Then we're going to use that mean and covariance to do Gaussian approximation. Um, and then under this Gaussian approximation, it will turn out to be rather straightforward to find the marginal posterior of beta 1. Um, so we'll actually be integrating over the Gaussian approximation, and that's why it's integrated, Gaussian approximation. So let's start to dive into step 1. So step 1 is the rotation. So we have, um, we have our model, y is equal to x beta. And so... We have a model y is equal to x beta, so what we're going to do, we're going to rotate it. So we're going to multiply it on the left with a matrix Q, a rotation matrix Q. Um, and then, so to rotate the data, so QY we're going to denote by tilde, so it's Y tilde and X tilde for the rotated design matrix. And we set, we set up, and we, the rotation is such that if you look at the matrix, you have design matrix X, if you look at this first column, so in general, like if you have a matrix X, it might be dense, the first column, it might just be all non-zero. But then we can always we can find a rotation such that um, all elements in that column become zero except for the first one. So basically what's, what's happening is that all these elements here, they have a, there's a certain, certain magnitude, the whole, the whole magnitude of that vector, of that first row, we basically collapse it onto this very first element. So this element is now equal to the norm of what this whole vector used to be. So we're not changing the norm of this first r column, um, but we are rotating it. And we do the same rotation to all the other, other um, we do the, this same rotation to all the other columns. Um, so this changes the data. 
This changes the errors, this changes the design matrix, but it does not change the betas. And also since uh, rotation is a one-to-one -one transformation, it does not change the likelihood. So we're not changing our posterior by doing this rotation. What about the errors? So the errors get rotated, but since we had IID Gaussian errors, um, the I, I, so uh, the diagonal covariance, uh, Gaussian with diagonal covariance is uh, rotationally invariant. So after the rotation, we, you can write out what the co covariance is, and it turns out the covariance hasn't changed. So we still ha are like in this easy, in this simple scenario where the errors are IID. Um, and now we can, okay, now we can inspect this, this, this rotated model, and then we can read off the first row. Um, and the first, so why do we read off the first row? Well, if you think about it, these are all zeros. And we're only interested in beta 1. So the way it works out is that all observations do not depend on beta 1 except for the first, except for the first row. So to do inference on beta 1, kind of only need the first row. Um, but then that first row, the first, the, the scalar model, as you can call it, as you can kind of consider it, still involves all the other betas. And actually all the other betas are influenced, are like you have information about them in all the other y's, not just in y tilde 1, but also in y tilde 2, y tilde. So we, so we can't just say, okay, hey, we have a scalar model, work, run with this. No, we still have to do something with this zeta, but at least we've now kind of say, okay, well, hey, we have the simpler model. If we now can do, can, can work with, if we can figure out how to kind of get rid of all the other rows now, which only involve zeta, uh, which only kind of influence zeta, then, then we're good to go. Kind of, because then we have a scalar model and we, and we can just do a numerical integration or something to find a posterior, a marginal posterior on beta 1. Is this rotation clear so far? Okay, good. So to make it even more clear or to make more, um, to more explain like why, how it's helping us is let's look at a graphical uh, representation of our model. So if y is equal to x beta um, and if x is dense, then each beta influences all y's. So this graphical model draws a line between two, th two, two points when they're like, if they're conditionally dependent. Um, so this is, so, so here we have a graphical model and um, people that might have done um, inference on graphical models know that if you, have, uh, if you have loops in your graphical model, then it's challenging to do uh, inference on your graphical model. If there's no, no loops, if it's a tree, then it's, then it's rather straightforward, but with all these loops, it makes it hard. So, we, so the solution kind of, like to make it easy, you would have to remove loops. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just, I'm just gonna redraw this graphical model. I'm gonna put beta one that's of interest to it on the right. It's gonna separate it, then I'm gonna move all y's except for y one to the left. So this is just like, shuffling the nodes, not changing anything to the graph, and I'm gonna do the rotation. And what the rotation is gonna do is gonna make all these zeros in our matrix. So basically it's gonna do, it's gonna say that beta one only influences y one anymore, and no longer all the other y's. So, so this changed our graphical model, and we still have all the loops here on the left, so it's still challenging. However, here on the right, beta one does not like form a loop with y tilde one. And so, and more generally, the, or more, more, more specifically, the all the betas, um, the influence of all the other betas can be influenced in this auxiliary variable zeta. So now here on the right, we have something that does not have loops. So this will be easy to inference on, but we just have to get rid of this dense part. So now we, all we kind of, what now Erga is gonna do is gonna approximately integrate out this dense part of the graph. So to do that, we need to, um, just what we're gonna do, we're gonna find the mean and covariance of the zeta given all, all these y tildes except for y tilde one. Um, so we have to, we're, gonna, we're gonna compute this mean and covariance or actually we're gonna estimate the mean and posterior mean and covariance. Um, and specifically we will be considering vector approximate message passing because it just turns out for these linear models and this IID priors or like these separable priors, this seems, this seems to perform really well. It's like really fast and can then scale to, high, to large problems. But more generally, there are, um, you can, it's like not, we're not constrained, we just wanna have estimates of mean and covariance. So there is also um, variations on the lasso that they use like the lasso point estimate as a posterior mean. And then there's some ways to kind of get a posterior covariance out of your lasso, um, out of your lasso algorithm. Um, you could just do run variational Bayes on this, on this kind of like sub, for sub problem, sub Bayesian problem, or you could just use any, any nice method that you prefer or do think is suitable for the problem you're looking at. Um, and it's kind of important to note, you don't have to actually be good on each beta, you just have to be good for the zeta, which is in some way a, a slightly easier solution, uh, problem because that's like a, a scalar rather than this P minus one dimensional 
a set of betas. And also, like, so beta one is of interest. So, so doing these computations does not affect, are, are not changed by like what the, by what the actual value of beta one is. So that's the estimate. So then we have the estimate the mean and the covariance, and then we're going to use the mean and covariance because we have. So let's see what we're looking at here. So we, we, the goal is to find this, this marginal posterior. So the marginal posterior up to proportionality constant can be written now, because it's a scalar model, we can write it as a scalar, scalar likelihood term. Um, then we have the prior on beta 1, and then we have the prior or posterior, depending on how you want to look at it, of this auxiliary variable. So we already computed the mean and the covariance of, ex of this auxiliary variable. So now we're going to put on a Gaussian on this um, zeta. So, and once we, so, so then we have, have some expression for this posterior, so we're going to approximate it with the Gaussian. And then, um, so under that, so now, and then we have like, then this is fully specified and we can, we can just compute the scalar integral. And actually it turns out it's not too challenging. It's actually, in this case, it's ex like exceptionally easy because if you have a Gaussian approximation on here, um, note that this term does not involve zeta, and this, the other term that involves zeta is also a Gaussian, because we assumed Gaussian errors. So actually, this is then a, a normal normal integral, which, which is readily, we don't even have to do numerical integration. Um, so that's, we do the Gaussian approximation. So, so far, everything we did was exact, except for this Gaussian approximation. So the whole rotation trick didn't change up stereo, but now we're doing the Gaussian approximation, so then actually we don't get the exact marginal posterior, but we get an approximation. So then the question is, how reasonable is this Gaussian approximation? So zeta is a projection, is a, is a, is a low dimensional projection of, of these many beta. So you have this beta 2 to p given this y tilde 2 to p, so that's a high dimensional posterior, and zeta is a low dimensional summary, low dimensional projection of it. So, in, so the, the, there is a field called projection pursuit where they're trying to find interesting characteristics of high dimensional distributions by looking at, at low dimensional summaries or low dimensional projections. projections. This especially comes back to the time when computational resources weren't as, as powerful enough to really explore high dimensional distributions. And people were trying to do that, but at some point there was a theoretical result that said, okay, well actually it's kind of a mission impossible because if you want to if you look at low dimensional projections of high dimensional distributions, they're in some sense, they're always close to Gaussian. So in that sense, back then there was a negative result. Um, but for us, it's a positive result in the sense that it says, okay, hey, my, maybe our approximation might make sense because we're also looking at a low dimensional um, summary of a high dimensional posterior. Of a high dimensional posterior. And additionally, a, a much more hand wavy way to look at this is can say, well, hey, zeta is a, is a, is a mixture is like a weighted sum of these betas. Um, so if these betas are independent, then the central limit theorem would, well, under some condition on the Jack Stilters, would tell you, okay, it will, might, for large p, it would be close to Gaussian. Well, that's, that doesn't really fly because these betas can well, actually often be highly correlated because they're like, they're like, they're in, it's because we're looking at the posterior distribution of these. But nonetheless, that's like, again, something that says, well, hey, maybe it's close to Gaussian or, like a different direction that says, well, hey, maybe just these betas themselves are already Gaussian, Gaussian, like have a Gaussian distribution because of like a, maybe some Bernstein from Mises theorem that says, well, hey, the posterior concentrates, gets closer to a Gaussian. Um, but that's, this is kind of really one waving, and waving. Now, so, so this is introduction to air gas. So we kind of like try to justify the Gaussian approximation a bit, but the main steps were then the rotation, then do. So BVM would be an N. And that's actually not really what we're interested in because we would say we want to do something where P is large and maybe N is small. So actually, it's not, it's not what we want, kind of. No, very good point. Yes, thanks. Um, so we rotate, do the mean and covariance estimation, and use that for Gaussian approximation. So we do, we rotate it, we get this auxiliary variable, we find the mean and the variance of the auxiliary variable. Then we use that to do, do Gaussian approximation on that, on that auxiliary variable. And then we plug in that Gaussian approximation into our scalar model. And that allows us to get an estimate of beta 1. OK. Are there any questions so far about this method, about ERGA? OK, if not, then let's talk a bit more about approximation accuracy. So we talked a bit about why the, the Gaussian approximation might make sense. 
Um, so it actually turns out that, oh, so let's, so we're going to look at two ways. We're first going to look at it a bit empirically, and then we're going to see a little bit about theory. So let's look at the Gaussian approximation accuracy. So, um, so let's see, can we see in practice whether this, Gaussian by whether this distribution is close to Gaussian. So here we take um, the design matrix equal to, to SNPs, to genetic data, and these are highly correlated, um, which kind of makes it challenge, more challenging based on like the um, central limit theorem heuristic justification kind of says, well, if these betas are independent, you're probably close to Gaussian. But if these X is highly correlated, your betas in this posterior will also be highly correlated, and therefore it might be more challenging for this to be close to Gaussian. Um, so these are highly correlated SNP from some, uh, from, from some existing genetic data. Then we generate data according to our specified model using this design matrix. We fix the design matrix. Then we just pick uh, one predictor at random. So that's basically our beta one that we're then trying to, to, to do inference on. And then with this beta one, then it specifies what y tilde of two to n is and so on. And then we just Okay, then we're interested in this, 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 uh, this, this distribution. So then we can do Gip sampling just to get like a, so we can give, going to Gip sampler for a long time. And then this is basically a thin subset of these uh, Gip samples um, for different problem setups. Uh, and then we can look at a QQ plot, a normal normal plot, see, okay, how does this distribution look Gaussian or not? And then, so here we look at different, so we're generating the data with uh, different uh, error variances, um, so it's different sigma squares. And we see that, so the, and we're also using different priors. So we're using a spike and slab prior, but we've also tried with a different, uh, di different prior, let's do a horseshoe prior. Like ERGA is kind of, long as this prior is separable, we can apply ERGA. Um, and we see that, in general, it looks reasonably close to Gaussian. We see that if the horseshoe prior, you make the, um, so here also, the, the non-zero part of these betas are Gaussian by a prior specification. And for the horseshoe prior, this is not the case. It's not as clear cut. Um, and we see that, but we see that for lower variance, it seems to deviate a bit more. And that's like if, you, if, you, if your error variance is lower, then your posterior is more informative, and then you might have more structure in your posterior, and therefore might be harder for then this low dimensional projection to be really close to Gaussian. Uh, but overall, we see, okay, well, hey, Gaussian approximation might make sense. So let's now look at it a bit from maybe a little bit more theoretical point of view. So let's, um, let's define the Wasserstein distance. So we're going to look at the Boston distance from P1 and P2, the two distributions, and then that's the infimum of their um, square distance between the two random variables and the square root of that, um, and, the inf and the infimum where then the infimum is taking, taken over all joint distributions on X1 and X2, where the joint distribution um, satisfies the marginal, so it satisfies P1 and P2. So this, this specifies a distance measure between distributions. Um, and so now we're going to look at, OK, let's look at the distance between the true posterior, like the true posterior on zeta, and its Gaussian approximation. OK, let's look at this um, Wasserstein distance. And it turns out that this is going to be small for most, for most, for most design matrices, for most projections, if if this, 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 this full posterior, so the, 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 this, this posterior from beta 2 to beta, beta p, is nearly isotropic and concentrates, uh, and its distance from its mean concentrates. Um, so it's like it's. It means that. Um, it usually will actually, usually when people talk about isotropy, they, they imply it because they, um, otherwise it's not much use in talking about isotropy. So let's say. Um, it means that beta, so this is beta 2 to p is, is, is of interest. Um, so this distance from its mean, so what's the distance from its mean? So th this is the posterior mean, y tilde 2 to n. So this is the difference, so the distance is this that this random quantity, because it's random, where then beta 2 to p is distributed according to, to the posterior, that this quantity, that this, this is the norm that that concentrates. So it means that 
So if you go back to like a Bernstein for me, so any kind of case where like n gets large, you would expect this to happen. But also if your posterior doesn't really concentrate, this might happen because the model might figure out, hey, this is roughly the signal to noise ratio. So it figures out what the, because you go back, it's like it's a linear model. So I might figure out what roughly the, 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 the signal to noise ratio is. And then it, um, then it can kind of might get, this might concentrate. But regardless of what, whether it not happens or not, um, it's like if that happens, then we have, then we can prove that this is small. So it doesn't make sense what you mean with, do you understand what I mean with the, the, the norm, that this norm, this random, random quantity concentrates? So another way to look at it, like if you look at the sample, so let's say the middle of this, these balls are like the, the mean of the, the distribution beta 2 to p. Um, it's, if then that's a mean, then it, the norm concentrate basically means that your samples then will, off, like will mostly be close to, to, to like the sphere of this ball with a certain radius. Um, that's actually not why I made these pictures here, but that, that's, um, once we talk about isotropy, it might make a bit more sense why. Um, Okay, so, so we need to be nearly isotropic and a disk from its mean concentrate. So what is isotropy? That means that if you, like the, the independent draws from this posterior are not too correlated. So if you then were to plot them on a, on, on a sphere or something like that, that they, they don't cluster. Like this will be non-isotropic, then there's some kind of correlation. They're either like stuck in a certain part of the globe or they like, there's like patches. And if it's isotropic, they kind of spread out. Um, So, so I mean, so this is really hard to compute. So yes, it's hard to to check. Is it, how different is this from Gaussian? Um, so first of all, the Gaussian is not always isotropic. You can have a highly non-isotropic Gaussian. But if you let's say we look at only at isotropic Gaussians, how different is this from a Gaussian? So, um, so. I mean, we can have a uniform distribution on a sphere, which is in some sense very non-Gaussian, and that would satisfy this. Or you can have a discrete distribution on the sphere that would still satisfy this. And in a certain sense, it's like very far away from Gaussian because of continuous distribution. But in an other sense, it is close to Gaussian. So in the way in which it's close to Gaussian is that any low dimensional, or like this type of, any low dimensional projection in a certain sense is very close to Gaussian, which is also a way of defi defining a Gaussian, where I think the Gaussian is the only distribution for which any low dimensional projection is Gaussian. You see, so, so actually there have actually been works where they use this as a way to define Gaussianness. how close is someone to Gaussian. But you can also do it reverse way, because in some, so, but it's a very, very good question, yeah. Yes, Neil. So th this, there's basically a bound that says this is less than epsilon with a certain probability, where the probability involves a, with, a, with a certain probability, and this probability is like a reasonably complex combination of a measure of isotropy and, and concentration of the mean. So I, I kind of simplified it here. Um, but it's, 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 it's a certain equation. And actually, there's kind of like, they have to, they have to basically go to, like you have to concentrate, go to zero at the appropriate rate. It's not entirely straightforward. Yeah. Yes, the, the, Jeremy, go first. Uh, I'm a bit confused how the, just the way you stated your result, because this the way the result is stated kind of assumes that you're using some sort of Gaussian approximation. Correct. Guys, right? this, is, this, is, this is only for a Gaussian approximation. Correct. This one, this result is. Right, so you're saying PI is Gaussian. Correct. With the exact with which Gaussian? It's the Gaussian that is, has the, the same mean and covariance as this distribution. Yeah, that's a very good point. I didn't, wasn't explicit about it. So actually, there's another type of approximation that we're doing because we were estimating this mean and covariance. Um, but if you have the exact one, then this one. Do you still have a question, Dan? So I guess the only thing that's not Gaussian in your model is the parallel. So you have a linear regression and you have a prior. Correct. So, 
So, well, okay, whether this is nearly isotropic and whether the distance from its mean consecrates, what it mostly depends on, what is the challenging part, is the design matrix. So, if you assume some random design matrix, or if you assume uh, like a diagonal design matrix, then things work out really nicely. Once you have like real statistical data, where you often you have complex higher order dependencies among the com columns of your design matrix, it becomes it becomes less obvious. And also, then this this distribution can be can be far from Gaussian. Just. Yes. If your prior is Gaussian, then every step in erga is exact. Yeah. Then, then there's no approximation happening. Correct. So, so but it doesn't need to be isotropic. The Gaussian is not. For a Gaussian, it doesn't have to be isotropic. That's correct. So this this result just requires it. So you're right. Maybe that's not the that's probably not a necessary condition. Yeah. The good so point. Maybe yes. Can, uh, maybe do some uh, decorrelation. Yeah. So I think there's some decorrelation. So, but the Yes, but it did, okay, so I think the reason why we don't have it is because we say for most small vectors of x, and what do we mean for most? It is somehow a, a uniform distribution on vectors, and then if you go to decoloration step, then this uniform is no longer a uniform distribution, but it's some other distribution, and then the, we're not really talking about random design matrices here, so then that makes our, a kind of a life difficult, how we present our results. But yeah, if we, so, but I agree we can, might be able to, Generalize this. So this is the Gaussian approximation accuracy. Now we're going to talk about, so that's actually not what we're really interested in. We're interested in this accuracy on beta 1, the marginal posterior. That, that's what we want to estimate. Or even if the Gaussian approximation is off, as long as we get that one correct, that's fine. So for that reason, let's introduce the kubik leiber divergence, which is the x, x so from the kubik leiber divergence from distribution P2 to P1 is the expectation with respect to P1 of the log ratio of P1 over P2. So this is, a, this is not a distant, distant metric, but it's a divergent. It also measures like this between two distributions. And um, it's in some sense, it's a really strong measure of this discrepancy. There are like distributions that look fairly similar, but for which the kubik leiber divergence is like infinity, because for instance, their supports don't overlap or things like that. So it is a very strong measure, in, some, in, a, in a certain sense stronger than the Wasserstein distance we were just looking at. And it turns out that if we have, so for a given Wasserstein distance, squared Wasserstein distance on our Gaussian approximation, then that gives us an upper bound on our kubik leiber divergence of the, of the marginal posterior we're actually interested in. So we have, um, so we have the marginal posterior, we have the erga approximation. So this is not a Gaussian approximation. This approximation might actually be quite non-Gaussian, but it uses a Gaussian approximation in there somewhere. And then, but it's not just that we, we it's not, but actually it's not just as explicit. It doesn't say, oh, this, this divergent is bounded. Well, actually there's some randomness involved because the thing on the right only depends on y tilde two to n. And we also have this randomness y tilde one, this first element. And that's like, that, that varies with the, no, with the noise. So actually then also the approximation varies with this. Um, and also then the distance between the true thing and the approximation varies with this, it turns out. Um, so therefore it turns out we can be bounded in expectation. Um, but the expectation is then with respect to y tilde one. So or, or you could say with respect to y, and then the expectation is a conditional expectation on y tilde two to n. And here actually the expectation is how is y distributed? Y is distributed according to, a, to, the, to, the, to our model. And then moreover, also there in that model, then beta is distributed according to the prior. So here, so this is a very Bayesian theorem in the sense that you're fully trusting your prize and everything for this to work. But it's, it, 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 we, we kind of needed it in our derivations because if you look at the posterior, you have a numerator and denominator and, and, and the ratio determines like your posterior. Um, you, you have like this, the normalization constant of your posterior. Um, and it turns out if you're like very far off, if you like very, like have a very, very far off from what your model suggests, including your prior, then your, the normalization constant can become really small and then these things become really hard to bound. And, but if you actually make this assumption, things play out really nicely also by writing the kubik leiber version as expectation and then things fall out nicely. So it's like if you're in a Bayesian, if you're like philosophically Bayesian, if you think your prior is correct and everything, your data comes from that, then we have this result. Okay.
This holds for any approximation. This doesn't require, so the previous result was on how good is this Gaussian approximation, how large is the number. This holds for anything. This holds for any kind of integrated rotator approximation. We don't, don't need to use the Gaussian one. We can use any approximation here. It's just, it just a function of this Wasserstein bound. So you can even just say, oh, you could even like, you could for instance say, well, my approximation is going, going to be a point mass at zero. And then basically the uncertainty in your zeta is, is going to tell you something about how good your approximation is. Basically say, okay, what if I ignore my auxiliary variable? If I ignore all these beta 2 to p, well, how, how good of a, how good of a inference on beta 1 do I get? Yes? So this one needs that, um, so I already talked about separate prior. The, the, the thing we need here, and, and later on when I go to the more general case, I'll, I'm more explicit about it. Beta, beta 1 and beta 2 to p need to separate. So here it's general. It's just a general. Well, no, so in the prior, beta 1 needs to be independent of the other betas. We need, we need that, because that allows for this separation of, of the model into a scalar part and high dimensional part. So then, so that was like a theoretical sort of approximation accuracy. So we looked at the, empirically at the Gaussian approximation accuracy. Let's also look empirically at the um, posterior approximation accuracy. So here we're looking at some, some, some uh, again, some kind of biomedical data, diabetes data, where we have 64 predictors. And this is too large to compute the posterior exactly, but what we're going to do is because we're going to run a, a GIP sampler for a long time. So this GIP sampler, I think, I run for like 12 hours. Um, um, even though like the approximation methods, they finish in uh, like a, a couple of seconds or maybe a minute. And then, um, so what I'm going to do, let's say you're interested in posterior inclusion probabilities. Um, so the, the, the posterior inclusion probability, so kind of we, we take our GIP sampler as a golden standard. So we say, okay, this is the kind of like a true posterior, posterior inclusion probability. And then we're also going to estimate it using ERGA, using expectation propagation, using variational bias. And then we're going to see, okay, what is like the absolute error in, there, in these estimates of posterior inclusion probability. And then we see that um, here over here, for instance, over the right, in this higher number, it's like you see that ERGA is getting it really well. So probably the decoupling, the rotation is, is, doing, is, is doing its job. It's like nicely able to decouple the problem, and then, and then mostly the most stuff is happening in the scalar model, which solves exactly. In other cases, like the Gaussian approximation is hurting us quite a bit. But, um, but overall, it turns out that on average, we're outperforming these other two methods. By the way, maybe for those of you that were very diligently paying attention, there was also a more recent variational Bayes uh, variable select, Bayesian variable selection uh, method by John Omerot that was published last, last year. Um, and they also tried that one, but that actually, in this example, performed worse. So I'm only giving you the, the one that performed better. So, yes? So what are you using to estimate those gaps in theory for I'm using vector approximate message passing. Um, yes. So, but, but um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's too sensitive to that. Would it be interesting to do EP and BB as well and just see the difference here? To do them inside the, the yeah. Um, Yes, I, I definitely could have done the Gaussian approximation using that. Um, I actually not sure whether that works that well because the, the vector approximate message passing works pretty well, including with correlated matrices, um, and it's also really fast. So that can't make like computational time a bit, a bit competitive. If I do any of these, it will be a bit slower because I'm doing Gaussian approximation here for each uh, predictor because I'm doing them one by one in this scenario. Um, but yeah, that, no, that's a very good point. I'm, I'm not sure which. I'm not not sure what way the direct, the results would go. Um, one thing I find like interesting here is that the certain predictors, certain marginals that both that all three methods struggle with. So it seems as like inherently there's like um, there's certain just certain parameters that are hard to do approximate inference on that they all struggle with. Yes. Correct. I do it. Do them. I just do each independently. I mean. Basically, because I was talking about this low dimensional, uh, like doing a scalar model, you can actually generalize it, and that's the next step to do it for, let's say, do, let's say take three the parameters together or 10, and then do, do, like, do like the 10 dimensional integral, which is actually feasible. It takes more time. And then you get better results. Um, but here I just did them one by one, like the most approximate case, kind of. Yeah. So, so far we looked at linear model. I think I should be able to finish in five. It's not much. I mean, the difficult part has been. This is just. Uh...
So with a linear model, so we, okay, we had a linear model and we just picked one beta. But you can also say, well, let's say you're in a different scenario. Say you're in a model and you have betas are your parameters of interest and beta is like low dimensional in some way or moderate dimensional. And the main constraint is that the number of betas needs to be less than the number of data points. Um, and then we have some other nuisance parameter that we're like, so we explicitly have a nuisance parameter. So for instance, you could be like in this, like let's say you have biomedical data, you want to find the effect of certain treatment or something, and you have measured genetic data, and you want to control for the genetic data, but the genetic data, it's like the genetic effects themselves are not of interest. You could, so we could frame it like this. So you have like a high, high dimensional nuisance term with all the genetic data, and then you have these, um, then you have the, the, predict, the, the, the predictors are actually of interest. So, and basically what we had before was, this is kind of our beta one before, and this is our beta two to P. So it's like the same setup. Um, but, but, so that was the, but that was for just for beta, like the linear model, but more generally we can do like some, maybe some non-linear model. And then we can, and basically the same thing holds. We can do this rotation. We can do, we can do rotation matrix Q, where now, um, before we had just the first column zeroing it all out. Now we just, now here actually R just needs to be an orthonormal a basis for the column space of X. It's kind of the same thing as we're doing before. It's just now a little bit high, high dimensional. And then, so if R, if R is spans column space of X, then if Q is a proper quotation matrix, S must be, like, must be orthogonal to X. So that means that S transpose times X is zero. So that means that the second model, again, the, the, the term involving X and this term involving beta drops out. So this is like our high dimensional term that has N minus P points. And here we have only P points left, which you said like P is less than N is like kind of small. And again, so again, this is what used to be a scalar model is now like a low dimensional uh, likelihood term. And then we have, again, we have an auxiliary variable. It's now not one dimensional, but it's P dimensional. But kind of like everything like goes through the same way. And we can just again compute, approximate it by Gaussian and we can compute the marginal, like not the, yeah, it's a marginal on beta. So it will be now be a low dimensional posterior of this high dimensional problem. Um, so this is kind of like a generalization, and here we have the same result. So again, whatever approximation you use in auxiliary term, again we have a bound on the Kullback Leibniz divergence with the Wasserstein distance. And here I've made it explicit that we need to have. So again, it's in this Bayesian context where we're drawing our data and our parameters according to the prior. That's for this expectation, and again we need to have the separation, separability of beta and and f. So this concludes what I want to talk about. So I have this IGA method that, um, that does a rather transparent, a, a reasonably transparent approximation that allows for a little bit of theoretical analysis and might give you a bit more insight about what actual approximation doing compared to, say, um, a method like expectation propagation or variational uh, Bayes. Um, but then also it's maybe less generalizable because it's like more specific to this problem. I mean, definitely have downsides as well. Here's some related papers. So I say the, the main, if you want to want to see the details of the theor theorems, um, they're, they're all in the, in the first chapter of my PhD thesis. Um, and then I have, a, I have the reference that, that, that came, came by in this talk. So are there any further questions? <laughs> So, um, and it's, it's actually similar to, um, to, to what they do actually in approximate message passing and some other of these regimes that really uh, exploit like this linear structure. And, and sigma squared, of course, is like not really a linear contribution. They do it in some kind of outer loop. So you do some expectation maximization or something in the outer loop. In our case, actually, because we have this low dimensional part of the model and this high dimensional part of the scalar model and this high dimensional model, um, it actually turned out pretty very effective um, to just do the, to to just learn sigma squared, the error variance only on the, only on the high dimensional part because that already has like most of your data points in there, and then just plug in that point estimate for the sigma squared into your first step, um, and that's actually what we did when I showed the, the empirical results. These, that's actually what we did here. So actually, variational Bayes has a better way of dealing with sigma squared, better way of dealing with the uncertainty of sigma squared, but nonetheless. We're like we were doing a cruder approximation, nonetheless we were getting getting closer to the true 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 solution. Just picture these errors, just the relative errors, right? Absolute errors. Yes.